Hi, and welcome to this eight Instagram marketing strategies video lesson. I'm Alice Roach, and I'm a senior research associate in the Division of Applied Social Sciences at the University of Missouri. This video lesson is part of a project titled Marketing Opportunities for Missouri's Niche Meat and Poultry Processors. The project received funding from the Missouri Agricultural and Small Business Development Authority, and using that funding, a team at the university has developed information and resources that Missouri meat businesses can use to enhance their marketing efforts. This particular video lesson is a follow-up to an earlier presentation about Instagram marketing basics, and in this presentation, the goal is to share with you more specific Instagram marketing strategies and research-based best practices. So the first strategy that I want to share is finding ways to capitalize on the creator studio. When Instagram launched about a decade ago, it really focused on being a mobile first platform. So in other words, Instagram didn't really make a lot of options available to, it, to its users to allow them to access and manage their accounts on anything other than a mobile device. The Creator Studio provides some added flexibility in that you can access this tool from any browser. So you can easily access it from a desktop or a laptop. If you are a business that wants to formalize your communication process or you're managing a lot of content or you want to plan and schedule your content in advance, then the Creator Studio is a good tool as it's sometimes easier to perform those types of activities on a desktop or in a laptop relative to a mobile app. So to access the Creator Studio, you'll first want to link your Instagram page and your Facebook page. The studio is a shared asset between Facebook and Instagram. So when you do create your Creator Studio presence, you can easily toggle back and forth between your Facebook and your Instagram page. So right now we are looking at the Instagram view, which will enable you to see the different capabilities that are provided within Creator Studio. You can see that we can create posts. If you click the drop down to the side of create posts and you'll have an option to schedule posts. And you can also access your analytics data via this insights tab. So again, the benefit of the Creator Studio is that you can conduct some of these types of activities on a desktop or laptop rather than relying solely on your mobile app. The second research-based best practice that I want to share is choosing effective visuals. So not only did Instagram originate as a mobile first platform, but it's also focused on offering a visually appealing experience to its users. To determine the types of visuals that have tended to perform best on the platform, Social Insider and Bannersnack conducted some research after reviewing more than 22 million Instagram posts between January of 2017 and July of 2020. You can see a sampling of some of the research findings here on the screen. And I first want to look at the difference in average engagement rate for image and video posts. So for video posts, the engagement rate averaged 1.5%. And for image posts, the engagement rate averaged 1.7%. You can see here in the chart that carousels perform slightly better in terms of engagement. So if you're not familiar with a carousel, essentially what it is, is a post that has multiple multimedia elements. So the all carousel average was 1.9% for engagement. And you can see that the image only carousels and video only carousels perform somewhat similarly. According to these data, we see that we can maximize our engagement by mixing photos and video in a carousel for one particular post. So with those mixed carousels in this data, we can see that the engagement rate averaged 2.3%. So the takeaway here is that you might look for ways to combine photo and video in one particular mixed carousel post to maximize your own engagement. If the previous slide got you excited about thinking about ways in which you can use carousels in your Instagram marketing efforts, you might be wondering how many slides are appropriate or how many pieces of communication materials are appropriate to include in a particular Instagram carousel. And the data up on the screen helped to give some insights into answering that question. So again, this was insights from Social Insider and Banner Snack. And what the analysis found from Social Insider and Banner Snack was that you tended to maximize engagement if you had eight, nine, or 10 slides in a given carousel. 
So if you have eight, nine, or 10 pieces of high quality content that would correspond with one particular post, then I would consider including that many pieces of multimedia content in a given post to see whether you can also capture higher engagement for your Instagram content. So I hope I've really stressed how important it is to find strong visual elements as part of your Instagram posts, but I also don't want to overlook the role of captions in your Instagram content. Captions can play an important role in explaining what users see in a particular visual that corresponds with the post. Additionally, the captions can play a role in helping to communicate the information that you'd like to share. So within an Instagram caption, you can include as many as 2,200 characters, but the best practice research suggests that shorter captions tend to work best. So ideally shoot for about 138 to 150 characters. Not only do you need to keep your Instagram captions succinct, but it's also really important that you cover the most important details first. That's because in a particular Instagram feed, Instagram will limit the amount of a caption that a user sees to two, three, or four lines. So the example up on the screen illustrates this point. So for any Instagram caption content that extends past that two, three, or four line limit, uh, you have to click more in order to see that content. So if a user doesn't click or tap on more, then that user is not going to be able to absorb the information that's shared in that caption. So sharing information up front in a caption is really important. Another good practice to, whenever you're developing Instagram captions is to feature a call to action. The call to action is really important because that makes it clear to your users about what you want them to do after they consume a particular piece of content. So one type of call to action might be posing a question as this example has done. The posing a question approach can help to facilitate dialogue between your business and your followers. Another type of call to action that you may want to add is some sort of URL where if they can, they meaning your users can go to that URL to perform a particular activity. However, you have limitations on Instagram in that you cannot include a URL in the caption content and have that be a live link. Instead, you'll need to include that live link in your bio and then in your caption, you can include instructions about accessing the particular URL in the bio. And the last tip with respect to writing compelling captions is to consider adding emojis to your captions. So when we think of captions, we, think, we tend to think about the written components of your message, and that's how I introduced it earlier. But you could also add emojis to add some color to your captions and also to add some further visual interest. The next research-based best practice that I wanna share is using tags wisely. And there are three types of tags that I wanna highlight. The first of those would be hashtags. A hashtag is a word or phrase that's preceded with a pound sign. There could be no spaces in a hashtag. So close any space between the pound sign and the first word or the only word of your hashtag. And then you also wanna close any spaces between words that you wanna convert into a hashtag phrase. There are four different categories of hashtags that I wanna to introduce to you. And those are niche, seasonal, location, and branded. Niche hashtags are those that are specific to products or services that you're offering. So let's give a scenario here and try to brainstorm some hashtags that would be relevant to that scenario. Let's just say that you are operating a retail meat counter in the Kansas City metropolitan area. And you have a goal to sell steaks for New Year's Eve celebrations that are being celebrated at home this year. So some niche hashtags that might apply here would be steak, steak lover, and steak dinner. All three of those would pertain to the particular product that you're marketing in that Instagram post. The second category of hashtags would be seasonal hashtags. So those can relate to a specific holiday observance or other time of the year when people tend to do a certain activity. Uh, seasonal hashtags in our example might pertain to New Year's Eve or New Year's because that's the time of the year when we're celebrating and we're wanting to promote our products to correspond with that time of the year. I also want to point out the data on the screen as, it, as that data relates to the seasonal hashtags. The data you see on the screen are the top 10 hashtags used by food and beverage companies in 2019. So these data were collected from Rival IQ and what Rival IQ did was it looked at Hashtags used in Instagram posts by 150 different food and beverage companies that each had at least 1,000 Instagram followers. 
So you can see that of the top 10 hashtags listed, three of those had some sort of seasonal connection. So we see Easter, Earth Day, and Valentine's Day listed as number six, seven, and eight respectively. So food and beverage companies do tend to use seasonal hashtags in their content. Location hashtags help to connect your content to a particular geographic area. So in our example from earlier, because we're operating a retail meat counter in Kansas City, Missouri, we might consider adding hashtags like Kansas City, Kansas City Mo, KC Mo to connect our content with the particular geographic area that we're serving. And the last type of hashtag that I wanted to explain would be a branded hashtag. A branded hashtag should be specific to your business. So we oftentimes see branded hashtags be the name of a business or a tagline that the business uses. With your branded hashtags, you want to ensure that you're the only company using those hashtags. So do your research in advance to ensure that no other business is already using the particular hashtag. If there are other businesses using that hashtag, it can become confusing if your users are clicking on what they think is a branded hashtag and then they're running across content from other businesses. In addition to making your branded hashtags unique, you'll also want to make them memorable so that when users see that hashtag, they automatically think of your business. And you'll also want to keep them relatively short. So shoot for about 10 to 20 characters. When you are brainstorming hashtags to use with your content, it's important to do some research in advance so you develop the best set of hashtags for your given content. And there are several different resources available to help you do that research. And the first would be to just use your Instagram app. So when you open your Instagram app, you have an option to search and then you can narrow your search to tags and then include a word that pertains to the particular post that you're writing. So in this case, let's assume that we're writing a barbecue post. So we search for barbecue and then what the Instagram app does is suggests other hashtags to use in our barbecue post. So here we can see that we have barbecue, barbecue time, barbecue sauce, barbecue chicken, barbecue ribs. All of those would be hashtag options to consider. In addition to sharing these options, the Instagram platform also provides a metric underneath each of those hashtags. So you can see the number of times that that hashtag was used in different posts. So you can see that the barbecue hashtag was used 4.3 million times. Uh, barbecue chicken was a little more obscure. It was used 35,000 times. Barbecue ribs was used less frequently 17,000 times um, in, in posts. So this may beg the question in your mind about whether or not you should use popular hashtags that tend to be frequently used or less popular hashtags. And really it's a best practice if you use a mix of both. There are a few other resources that are available to help you brainstorm ideas for hashtags. And these are called hashtag generators. One option would be meta hashtags. So at this website, you enter in a possible hashtag, you click generate hashtags, and then the site will help you to brainstorm other options. And the second service that I wanted to mention would be Photoloo. So Photoloo Photo works a little differently in that you upload a photo and then after you upload that photo, the site will help you to brainstorm some potential hashtags that might correspond well with that particular image. In a particular Instagram post, you can include as many as 30 hashtags. However, the best practice research suggests that you don't overdo it. So ideally look for about maybe two to three hashtags in each of the categories that I mentioned earlier. If you do have a need to include a large number of hashtags and you think that those hashtags make the post look somewhat cluttered, there are different ways that you can somewhat hide those hashtags to make them less obtrusive. Um, so the first strategy is highlighted here in this Purdue chicken example that you see up on the screen. So what Purdue Chicken has done with this post is that it started the caption with some text to explain what you see in the image. And then it's also um, asking you to visit the link in the bio. But then it separated that first part of the caption from the hashtags with a series of three lines that have one period per line. So that separation can make the post a little easier to read. Another strategy to hide those hashtags would be to post your content and then add a comment to the post with the hashtags copy and pasted into that comment. If you follow that route, you'll want to add the comment and the relevant hashtags immediately after the post goes online. Because when you're looking at a series of search results for hashtags, the posts are organized with the most recently posted post 
in the first position of those search results. If you've not yet used the hashtags or added the hashtags in a comment, then you won't have the opportunity to really benefit from that top search position. It's important when you are brainstorming hashtags to vary the hashtags that you use in each post. If Instagram sees that you're using the same 15 hashtags in every post, then the Instagram algorithm will basically penalize your posts. So you'll want to really narrow the hashtags that you're using to the particular content that you're sharing. And then the last tip about using hashtags wisely would be to capitalize the first letter of words. If you have a long string of words in a phrase hashtag, it can be very hard to read those, those words and to pick out what the phrase is intent, what you're intending the phrase to say. And so by capitalizing the first letter of each word, that can improve readability. The second type of tag that I wanted to mention would be tagging other businesses. And this is a great opportunity if you collaborate or partner with other local businesses. For instance, if you operate a retail storefront and you're stocking products from other local businesses, then you can call them out, like this example up on the screen does, to help build awareness of their business. And maybe some of your followers don't already follow that local business, so you can suggest that they do follow the local business and stay up to date on what's happening. By doing that, tagging the other businesses, you have the opportunity for those other businesses to possibly return the favor, which may introduce your account on Instagram to other individuals who might be interested in your brand and your business, but aren't already following you on Instagram. The third type of tag that I wanted to highlight would be shopping tags. So shopping tags are an option if you've set up Instagram shopping and you have some sort of product catalog created. So I'll show you through a series of visuals here about how the shopping tags work and why they're such a nice feature. When you see a post with a shopping tag, you'll notice this little shopping bag in the lower left-hand corner. When a user clicks or taps that shopping bag, the Instagram platform will load a new page that features these specific products that are being highlighted in this post. If the user then taps or clicks view products, then another screen will load to indicate where that consumer can go online to buy that particular product. So shopping tags are nice because you're essentially creating a pathway for a particular user to purchase the products that you are highlighting in an Instagram post. So no longer are Instagram posts just limited to building awareness for products, but you could actually, again, create a pathway to generating sales of particular products that you're featuring in your Instagram posts. So that leads me to our next research-based best practice, best practice rather, which is looking for ways to sell direct. eMarketer conducted some research in mid-2020 to find the extent to which U.S. adults have said that they've purchased via social platforms in the year preceding the research survey. And you can see that a majority of U.S. adults said that they did not purchase via social within the year preceding the survey but 10% of US adults said that they did purchase via Instagram. So I think that this is a real opportunity for future growth, particularly as we see features like shopping tags um, arise. So you do have an opportunity to really facilitate some of those direct on-platform sales. The next research-based best practice that I wanted to share would be to create stories. So Instagram really pioneered this storytelling type format on its platform. And so stories refer to a combination of multiple multimedia elements. Um, ultimately, when you create a story, it will only live on the platform for a 24 hour period. So the multiple multimedia elements that you can consider for an Instagram story include photos, video, and then a variety of stickers. So the stickers can be polls, they can feature different hashtags, locations, a countdown, they can mention other Instagram accounts. And so they really create an interesting mashup of these various multimedia elements. But given that stories will only live on the platform for 24 hours, you may be wondering whether stories are worth the time and effort that you invest in creating them. And for three reasons, I think that stories are a effective form of communication. And the first is that stories will show at the top of the news feed. So whenever an Instagram user first uh, logs on to the uh, platform, those stories will be what those users see first. And so when those users are seeing that type of content first, they may be more likely to interact with that content. So that's a real advantage of stories. 
Stories also give you the option to add depth and a lot of interactive features that you wouldn't ordinarily get with a more static image or just a simple video. And related to that, stories provide opportunities for creative differentiation, meaning that the way that you approach creating a story with all of these different multimedia elements likely will be different from how other businesses and competitors uh, address this creating stories on their own. And so that creative differentiation is a great way to uh, really set yourself apart on Instagram. The next research-based best practice would be to identify and engage influencers. If you're not familiar with influencer marketing, essentially it's a business partnering with an Instagram influencer who is someone who has amassed a large number of fo followers who tend to be pretty loyal. And that influencer is also willing to partner with brands and help to share brand stories. So you may wonder why influencer marketing has really gained popularity in recent years. And I think that it's really for two key reasons. When an influencer posts content, the users who interact with that content really perceive it as almost like they're hearing from a friend. So the Instagram influencer develops trust with those followers. And so that adds credibility to the messages that that influencer then shares. Uh, so the message can feel less impersonal and like traditional advertising can be and can really offer um, a more personal approach to sharing a given message. In terms of who tends to make a good influencer, there are three characteristics to keep in mind. First, you want to identify influencers that tend to have a large number of followers because that will increase your potential reach or will enable you to reach out to more Instagram users. However, just the sheer number of followers that an influencer has isn't the only important metric to consider when you're thinking about um, those, those followers. You want to ensure that those followers are also part of the audience that your business would ultimately like to reach. So does that audience have interests that would align with your business and values that would align with your business? So really diving deep and understanding the followers associated with a given influencer would be a, an important consideration. And then last, you'll want to ensure that the influencer has strong post engagement. So what's that suggesting is that you not only want an influencer who can reach a large number of people, but you also want those influencers followers to want to hear and engage with that influencer and engagement is a good metric for that ideally you're looking for about a 10 percent to 20 percent engagement rate which would suggest that those instagram uh, followers of that particular uh, influencer are interested and engaged in what that influencer is sharing if you wanna begin reaching out to an influencer, it's important to first have a budget in mind because influencers are paid for sharing about businesses and businesses, products and services. Uh, the compensation that's appropriate for an Instagram influencer really runs the gamut. Um, according to some research from Influence Company in 2017, the average Instagram influencer received about $270 per post. But there are a lot of mega influencers um, out there on Instagram that command a much higher compensation rate per post. For instance, Kylie Jenner tends to be one of the most recognized Instagram influencers, and she may earn as much as $1.2 million per post. And so there is a lot of variation there in compensation. As a general rule, if you're looking to start the conversation with a potential influencer, um, a good place to start would be about $100 per 10,000 followers. In addition to understanding compensation rates up front, it's also important to establish other expectations when you're working with an influencer. So those other expectations may pertain to what time of day or day of the week you want the influencer to post, the types of key messages that the influencer should include or other mandatories like hashtags that you want the influencer to include. Um, it's additionally important to understand when you're engaging with an influencer that you need to follow all FTC regulatory guidelines. So the FTC requires that you disclose brand relationships. And so in the influencers post, the content needs to be very upfront about that being a sponsored post or being a promoted post. Um, that there's, there's financing behind that post essentially. So you'll wanna be upfront about sharing about that brand relationship. 
Um, you, to be upfront, you can share things like ad or sponsored content at the beginning of a post. If you have multimedia elements like video or Instagram stories that are part of the post, you'll want to ensure that you also add that disclosure information to those multimedia elements. So it's very clear that that particular user, that influencer rather, has received compensation for um, creating that content and posting that content. So being consistent and sharing that that post or those posts are promoted is really important. So users can get to know how those disclosures are made and they can easily recognize them. So you'll want to disclose any kind of brand relationship. So that includes whenever you pay a influencer to provide a certain post. Uh, and that payment not only includes cash payments, but also would include offers, discounts, free product, and so forth. And the last tip with respect to identifying and engaging influencers would be to find a way to track performance. So you are investing funds into influencer marketing. Uh, and so you'll want to ensure that you're able to measure the return on that investment. And there are a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, for one, if you're asking your influencer to share a promo code, then you can use a unique promo code that you wouldn't share elsewhere in your marketing efforts. And then you can measure the number of times that that code was used or the total sales volume that were attributed to that given code. You can also ask that the influencer share a given URL by including that URL in his or her bio. And then that URL can direct to a particular web page where a um, user can conduct some sort of activity. And then you can track the number of times that URL was used. And then the last research-based best practice would be to refer to your analytics. So this is really important because uh, in this presentation, I've shared a lot of general best practices that tend to apply um, to an average of Instagram pages or Instagram users, but your audience will be unique. And so your analytics data really provides you a chance to get an in-depth look about your audience and that audience's behaviors and preferences. And ultimately, you can use that information to adjust the approach that you take on Instagram. You can access your analytics in a couple of different formats. So earlier I mentioned how the Creator Studio enables you to access analytics, and you can also access those analytics from your Instagram mobile app. So I'll show you first how to access your analytics on the app. And on the app, you have two opportunities to access two different types of Instagram analytics. And the first is that you can access your analytics on a post by post basis. So if you're interested in a particular post analytics, you can go to that post and then below the visual element, you'll see a view insights link. If you click that, then you'll be directed to a screen where you see a variety of post insights, which can share just how, how well that one particular post performed. If you're looking for more general data about your account, then you can go to your profile page Click the hamburger icon in the upper right hand corner. So the hamburger icon is that icon with the three horizontal lines. When you click it, you'll then be able to choose insights. From there, you can see an overview of your account for a particular time period. And then you can drill a little deeper into seeing how your posts have performed, your content has performed during a given time. So you can choose to review your analytics by posts, story, stories rather, or your Instagram TV videos. So if you click posts, for example, you can then choose the type of metric that you'd like to see over what period of time, and then the app will provide that information for you. You can access that same insights um, platform by going to your profile page and clicking insights, which you see um, about halfway through the screen. So this is just an alternative route to access that same information that I showed on the previous screen. So again, you also have the option to access your analytics from the Creator Studio. So just ensure that you have selected your Instagram view at the top of the page, and then you can access two different types of insights. You can access activity insights, an example of what that graphic looks like is here on the slide. And then you can also access data specific to your audience. So here you can see the gender of your followers and also an age distribution of your followers. And you can also learn more about when your followers tend to be on Instagram by time and day. That information is helpful so you can schedule your post at a time when you have the greatest chance to reach the greatest number of your followers. So that wraps up this video lesson. Thanks so much for joining us.